Jeff, thank you, and uh, thanks a lot for the chance to, to contribute. It was great to catch up and collaborate with colleagues over lunchtime. Um, what I hope to be able to do is, is not just talk um, about the work that the FDS do and, and, and the objectives that we try to achieve, but also take some time to, to look at the extent to which there, uh, there are general elements to some of those inclusion principles and to look at hopefully some tangible uh, frameworks that we believe would help uh, in terms of including uh, more of those people that I'm sure, and I would have heard it if that train hadn't been cancelled this morning, I'm sure that Mike Diaper emphasised this morning, because there is a real shift and a push towards understanding that one of our challenges is that our current context uh, reflects approaches that need to change. That doesn't mean everything that's been done is wrong, it just means that it's not necessarily been that effective at engaging significant numbers in our population. So EFDS have a vision, purpose, outcomes like everyone else. Um, disabled people are active for life is that vision. It's a vision that when it exists, you, know, you wouldn't need an organisation like ours. But the purpose is important to define, and that's why collaboration's key, because we don't exist to deliver those uh, opportunities. We exist to help other organisations better include disabled people in sustainable ways for the long term. We've been focusing our outcomes at three levels as well, and it's quite interesting that the big push with the government's and Sport England strategy towards defining those society level outcomes has captured a lot of interest. But I think it would be important for me to just reinforce that that's where a number of us have been seeking to operate for a while, because our sort of six-year-old strategy was very centred around the benefits that would accrue from being active and the outcomes for individuals, but also for society. And that's still solidly uh, at the centre of what we do. We also look uh, at the organisational outcomes Our strategy, and not everyone will be able to access this, but just to sort of quickly introduce it, is centred around what makes individuals motivated to be active. At the core, and I'll come back to this, there are certain outcomes that our research tells us that disable people, and we also are confident, and we're testing this, that other inactive populations will relate to. These are things that will get people motivated. They link directly to those society level outcomes that the government and Sport England are advocating. There's a direct link between an individual's health and the health of the nation. There's a direct link between uh, friendship and connections and social cohesion and the extent to which communities come together and develop. In that central pink ring, we've got the EFDS version of what it is that we bring to the party. We think if we do those things well, we will help other organisations more effectively engage those disabled people at this, that are at the centre of our purpose. And if we help those organisations do that well, we'll all be better able to meet those wider outcomes around uh, the edge. And in particular today, I'm, I'm going to be talking more about how our research at Insight, which has solidly repositioned our approach to work, will hopefully help other organisations to be more effective. There are no shortage of statistics around. Um, for those who uh, can't see this, the, it, it, it's full of exciting and interesting statistics about how, diver how diverse our society is. And that's such a positive context to work from, but it's not often been the starting point for people thinking about how they approach work. At the bottom of the middle column reinforces the extent to which disabled people, as one in five of the population, are such a key target audience. But in the top right, You'll also see 
you'll also see that um, disabled people are the least active group in our population. In terms of those targets to get people more active, this is a group that we can all, through thinking about how we do things, achieve much more. One of the points, and it came up uh, uh, in the workshop uh, earlier that Joseph led, was about the question of whether disabled people uh, should be active in dedicated, adapted, exclusive contexts or in a more inclusive setting. And it's really important to remember that the answer is both. But it's perhaps also important to recognise two things, that perhaps historically, dedicated, adapted sessions probably predominated in terms of provision for disabled people. And it's even more important to recognise that disabled people themselves tell us that being active in an, in an inclusive setting is their principal objective. And very few of them, or less than half of those that said they wanted that, say that that's the current context. So that point about disabled people wanting to be active in inclusive sessions, uh, uh, opportunities, led us to look at some of our existing insight and see how we could build on that. And I'm just going to touch in a moment on how we've taken that forward. But really significantly, there's, a, there's an equal welcoming proposition from non-disabled people, or able-bodied people, as some would say, from non-disabled people, saying that, yes, we too are interested in that proposition of being active in an inclusive uh, uh, opportunities and sessions uh, with disabled people. We've... Um, been on a journey with our research and I think it's fair to say that where we started five years ago was to say how much do we really know about disabled people, what motivates them, what drives their information sources, what might actually uh, enable all of us to be better able to engage disabled people in sport, physical activity, active recreation. What we recognised, and this again came up in Joseph's se uh, session earlier, is that actually there are a number of players in this field, and actually supporters or carers can be key to help or hinder disabled people to become active. And what we understood from that research was that actually there might be some different work and different messages and different things you need to do with that group to make them better able to support disabled people into activity. I'm really interested in what we've recently done, and it's uh, yet to be published, and I'll just give you a couple of slides on it in a moment. We thought, actually, if we're advocating inclusive opportunities, what do we know about what, uh, what non-disabled people think about that proposition? And that, in a sense, was a partly a, a, a risky uh, a venture for an organisation that focuses on disabled people being active, but really crucial if you want to take forward uh, that proposition on, on inclusion. We've done those three pieces of work and we're just in the process of a fourth piece of work, which is quite intensively um, working to understand the views of deliverers. And when we say deliverers, it's quite interesting how the landscapes change. If we'd been doing this research funded by Sport England, uh, it is important to acknowledge have understood the need to invest in research like this and a lot of the work that we do. That if we'd been doing it five years ago, they'd have said, just ask NGBs. Because the answer used to be, NGB, what's your question? And I, I do think it's important that we do ask NGBs and we work closely with sports providers. But it's also important in this piece of work that we understand how other providers of active recreation opportunities, how they operate and how they feel about inclusion of disabled people in their offer. Just want to spend a few minutes back on this piece of work we did with uh, non-disabled people. And the reason I've pulled out these three slides that I'm just going to touch on is because they set some of the context for our challenge and our opportunity because they outline the preconceptions in reality that people have about disabled people. 
we asked a lot of things. One of my, one, when we published this, have a look at the stuff about would you be happy for your daughter to marry? And I'm really pleased that more people would like their daughter or son to marry a disabled person than an MP. It's quite, <laughs> it's quite, it's quite a helpful insight. But what we wanted to do was to just make it accessible and make people understand that sometimes you may prejudge what an MP is, you may prejudge what a disabled person is. We asked, we asked people here what they thought about disabled people's uh, ability to easily play sport or be active, or to have a full-time job. And on the play sport or be active, the, 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 there are only some impairment group, groups shown here, but the total result was that less than half of people thought disabled people could uh, uh, play sport or be active. But you can see that there are differences in perspective within that, ranging from uh, an assumption that 73% of hearing impaired people can or uh, would easily play sport, and yet under the old active people survey, we know that um, hearing impaired people were the least active group. So there's some quite interesting uh, presumptions built within it. In terms of having a full-time job, it's fascinating to think that only those who are hearing impaired hit a majority of non-disabled people's assumptions about whether they could hold down a full-time job. What I would say briefly about this slide is that when you look at the question about an inclusion, and we did have some people saying we don't really know what inclusion is, but they almost always did. We don't know what the term means, but does it mean everyone doing things together? Yes, that's what it means. But people feel that it's less likely that an inclusive environment would succeed if it's non-competitive. The bottom two examples are about team sports and one versus one. The top two examples are about group or individual exercise and activity. We do need to address two things in there. One, the fact that not all activity has to be competitive. Two, the fact that disabled people can and will be competitive and should be supported in being, in being competitive, and sometimes that will be in a dedicated setting, but it can also, thirdly, be made to work in inclusive session uh, opportunities. And we've got evidence of how inclusive provision can enable competitive opportunities as well. I think in terms of preconceptions, it's quite helpful to capture some of this and, and, and again those who were able to be in Joseph's sessions will, will this will resonate hopefully the, that it's about where people are starting from, what are your presumptions but in reality even though people say that they agree that disabled people uh, are equal to non-disabled, that they're no different, that they're people like me, implicitly and this was quite clever work that Comrades did for us the real numbers about how people feel in their core are different. If they thought about it a bit and said what they thought they ought to answer, they're more likely to agree with that proposition. But instinctively, we're starting from a more challenging proposition. So just briefly in the last couple of minutes, I, I just wanted to revisit hopefully information that we've pushed out before based on our research and is at the centre of our Get Out, Get Active programme. Our research tells us that if you try and pursue a number of very simple principles, you will maximise your, your, your potential to engage disabled people. All of this is available in great detail on our website, but think about how you drive awareness. This isn't rocket science nor exclusive to disabled people. In terms of engaging the audience, focus more on the individual or the values, the outcomes, the objectives that they're driven by rather than just the presenting opportunity or their presenting characteristic. Don't just put a poster up for a disability sports session with a picture of a wheelchair on it, presuming that the dedicated opportunity will resonate with all disabled people, because it might not. And then the third group are all the practical things that we should all be doing anyway at the point of delivery, which is about thinking about the individual customer, understanding what would make that session work for them. More detail there than I've got time to go into, but all the slides will be available. 
really at the end, I just wanted to come back to this, the, the individual values that our research tells us will drive inactive people's shift towards participation. This focus on family and support systems, thinking about siblings, thinking about the whole family, looking at advocating the opportunity to develop friendships and make connections. This point about helping me progress in life and improve my health. Mental strength and well-being and having fun and feeling free initially were part of uh, an independence proposition. And when we did more work, we realized there were two sides to that. Disabled people are disproportionately dependent on others. So that sense of independence is really powerful. But similarly, the drive towards having fun, having fun and feeling free is the other side of that coin and a much more attractive and positive coin as well, uh, point as well. <coughs> so just finally, um, you know, this is more than just numbers, but numbers are really, really important. Pete, I, I, I love the focus in London on, on uh, getting a million people more active, and I think we should all be doing that. I love that I referenced the Sport and Recreation Alliance contribution to the manifesto. All of those things need to do, but my core point is that if you apply the right principles and values, you can do that in a way that A, is genuinely inclusive, and B, maximizes your chances of engaging audiences that traditional approaches have failed. Thank you.